Thank you, Elizabeth, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the Academy on my behalf as well. So as uh, Elizabeth uh, showed, each model of the Academy is uh, dedicated to address a specific type of energy citizenship barrier that we have identified in the AC Square's uh, research results. And with the help of expert speakers and you participants as well, we will be also sharing good practices and tools which then would support you on what you're already doing uh, to better engage people in energy transition transition uh, in your community. And as this is the first session, we will need to start by explaining uh, the key concept, which is energy citizenship. So I will try to provide you with a definition and reflect briefly also why it matters. And I will start by discussing energy citizenship and then move to energy communities to see how these two connect to each other um, in our approach. And this presentation is basically a summary of the uh, research done in Easy Square project, but also the policy brief, which was published uh, only recently. I'll ask you to uh, link it to the uh, chat. That there's the additional resources and materials also available in the Academy's website. So please visit our, our self-learning materials there um, after our event. So energy citizenship is a citizenship-based approach to energy transition. So uh, the term was introduced in research um, only quite recently uh, and in the fields of sociology and psychology, especially. Alongside this uh, theoretical work, uh, you might have noticed that there has also been rising attention to citizen participation and uh, engagement in the energy sector. And the approach recognizes that people have a huge potential to contribute uh, to and to speed up uh, the decarbonization process. Um, the existing uh, approaches are, however, quite fragmented, and we see that they have not managed to harness the full power of these bottom up initiatives and citizen power. And uh, in the EU, from a purely technological perspective, research estimates that almost all EU citizens would have the possibility to become prosumers, meaning that they could be producing and consuming renewable energy individually or collectively, ladder meaning, uh, ladder meaning um, setting up an energy community or joining one. And however, we see that technological innovations alone are uh, not enough for people to actually to be able to or to be willing to make use of, uh, of these possibilities. Um, in the literature, there are multiple definitions for energy citizenship, and they each highlight a little bit of different aspects. Um, there is, however, a lack of legal and economic research on the topic and understanding these more structural challenges and factors. So in Easy Squared, uh, we started our work from the need for a uh, truly interdisciplinary definition and understanding uh, of the concept, what constitute, uh, constitutes energy citizenship citizenship and what are the barriers and enablers for people to become uh, ener active energy citizens. We are also building our uh, building on existing concepts uh, out there, especially the community energy, prosumerism, energy and democracy. But we have also aimed to create the new openings with the uh, with the interdisciplinary work and by connecting theory to uh, to practice. And finally, in terms of formal justification, we rely on the obligations uh, from existing policies. So in the EU, the term energy citizenship is not explicitly mentioned in policy documents, but it is implied in various ways, especially in the clean energy uh, for all policy package, which some of you might be familiar uh, with. Um, the directives there present citizens as uh, proactive players participating co-creating energy transition, and they introduce renewable energy communities and citizen energy communities as uh, formal new formal actors to energy markets. But however, uh, studying the broader context, we actually notice a remarkable systemic tension and incoherences still remaining both in the EU and national local level. Um, the existing approaches are mainly top down and operate within a very market oriented uh, neoliberal logic. And these tensions then manifest as practical barriers and thresholds for people who want to take action. Um, they are not 
these barriers are not only about uh, energy technology, but also, also about the broader structures such as housing regulations, for example, property rights, social policies, social networks, inclusivity, and so on. These are all that we are uh, trying to tackle in the academy as well. So as a result of these uh, barriers, energy systems are difficult for people to navigate administratively, financially, and then mentally. Mm, so we use the following definition that brings together legal, economic, and psychological perspectives. Um, it's uh, energy citizenship is people's rights to and responsibilities for a just and sustainable energy transition. So this short definition uh, provided us a basis for both the theoretical work and practical work. And I would like to unfold this a uh, little further. First of all, the focus is on people. So energy citizenship is not only about uh, for citizens of specific nation states. Uh, with, when we talk about citizens in this context, we actually talk about people and households engaging with the energy system. So this is in contrast to simply treating people as consumers. Um, as citizens, people have a proactive role and agency democratic rights um, that exceed those of a consumer. And then people also have a right to participate in energy transition and energy system, not, uh, no matter whether they make use of it uh, or not. So in other words, energy citizenship is a universal um, definition. And we see that the active forms of uh, energy citizenship are the ultimate goal, but we also recognize the differences in people's capabilities, abil capacities and abilities. Um, there are many ways of making use of these rights, uh, many ways of being an energy citizen, uh, from being aware of uh, one's energy choices and uh, energy transition issues uh, as a consumer, to then installing your own solar uh, energy plan, for example, becoming a member of an energy community. And responsibilities are the other side of the coin of the for the rights. So here meaning individuals, uh, there are responsibilities to participate in the political and social processes, but we also refer to the sense of uh, responsibility uh, because of the psychological work, but people are, all, people are also not expected to act alone. So here there's an, a responsibility also for structural actors. So public authorities, legal, economic, and social conditions also play a strong role in enabling um, energy citizenship. And in this academy, as the name already implies, we're focusing especially on energy communities as a potential uh, tool to mainstream and strengthen energy citizenship. Um, so here, when we talk about energy communities, we refer uh, to both formal and informal community energy initiatives, so-called uh, collective energy actions sometimes, um, where people have joined their forces to democratically own, consume, finance, and uh, distribute energy. And what we see is that energy communities can unite a number of aspects of uh, energy citizenship. They can bring energy transition closer to people, democratize and decentralize decision making, increase the resilience of uh, the energy systems, and then provide a variety of other environmental, social, and economic benefits for their members and potentially beyond. As a collective approach, energy communities can provide them a method to share the cost and benefits of decarbonization, provide affordable energy and address energy poverty, those promoting solidarity also in our energy systems. Uh, so the work uh, on energy citizenship is pa also part of supporting a better use of energy communities as a tool for sustainable and just uh, energy transition. But this relationship between energy citizenship and energy communities is not straightforward and self-evident, especially when it comes to mainstreaming energy citizenship. So, for example, attracting new members, providing benefits to non-members. So in our ongoing psychological studies in Easy Square, we're also studying why people join energy communities and how different setups of energy communities affect people's ability or willingness to join. And these uh, lessons, uh, the lessons of these different setups will be also shared as part of this academy within, over the course of it.
I think that was the last slide. So this was my very general introduction to the theoretical background and definition of energy citizenship, which hopefully helps you to orient towards our panel discussion next. So I will be giving the spotlight to our three energy community and energy citizenship leaders. Uh, the discussion aims to help you to better understand what uh, energy citizenship could look like in practical work and uh, to learn from their experiences and reflections on how to support empowerment of energy citizenships, uh, energy citizens. And after the panelists have responded to uh, my questions that I planned for them, I will also open the floor for participant questions. So you can either wait until the end of the panel to ask your questions uh, by raising a hand or then type in the chat whenever you have a question, we will respond to them verbally. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll present you our panelists. Um, first, we have Jura Erland, representing Buchka Initiative in the Netherlands. Um, he has an impressive 25-year track record in the energy sector, and Jura wor uh, started working first on the supply side and then distribution side in a company called Enexis. Um, and in 2019, Burka became a social enterprise independent from Annexis. So currently he holds the position of a product developer uh, at Burka with a special focus on research. And I look forward especially to learning about their focus on neighborhoods and the neighborhood power, which is literal translation of Burka. And um, I'll ask my fellow uh, facilitators to pin Jura uh, as a, to the big screen, if uh, you can. And I'll stop short, uh, sharing the screen uh, and introducing uh, then uh, Lucila Borio. I want to welcome her as well from Torre Superiore uh, Eco Village in Italy. He is, uh, she's one of the founders of the Eco Village, transforming an, an abandoned medieval village into a sustainable eco guest house and a training center. So, as a member of Dura Nirvana Social Cooperative, uh, which manages the Eco Village, she is engaged in various activities related to sustainable transition, such as social farming, low impact lifestyle, and so solidarity actions for refugees. And finally, I also want to learn, uh, we also want to learn more from newly emerging initiatives. So last but not least, I want to welcome Sam Odong, who is currently training to become an energy citizenship leader with another EU funded project called Include. Um, with Include, Sam and other motivated and um, influential uh, citizens and community leaders alike are developing their own decarbonization initiatives. Um, Sam has a Bachelor of Science degree in Water Resource Engineering, and he's currently working in the Isimba uh, hydropower plant in River Nile Cascade in his home country, Uganda. Those, he also has this full-time job in the energy sector, but we also want to learn more about his work with developing and starting up his own bottom-up initiative. And um, yeah, thank you, uh, Sam and Jura, for being here with us. And um, yeah, I, I also want to say, by the way, that our work in EC Square has so far mostly focused on EU context, but the academies also are attempt to show universal, um, uh, universal nature of energy citizenship to learn about the contextual differences and connect energy citizenship leaders across borders. And this is why we also have uh, speakers uh, from different countries. So thank you, Sam, Lucila, and Jura for being here. And I would uh, start with Jura, uh, the first question. And uh, so I said, I uh, Burkhardt literally translate uh, into neighborhood power, and uh, you believe in the strength um, of people in neighborhoods. So in practice, you work between municipalities and other governmental actors and the residents of neighborhoods, acting uh, kind of like an independent mediator. So could you please describe your collaboration and relationship with uh, government actors, especially with municipalities, um, and how you collaborate and help them with uh, their work in energy transition. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Yuyi. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, they're, they're doing some gardening uh, outside my house. So if, if there's a noise, I will switch to my headphones. But uh, 
Uh, just let me know. Um, yes, uh, we, we are we are a, a kind of a mediator between uh, uh, municipalities and uh, citizens or neighbors, residents, um, because in the Netherlands the um, municipality uh, has the has the role of the director for the energy transition. So they have to make sure everybody in the Netherlands uh, switches to an alternative uh, heat source. We have to get rid of natural gas. Um, you might know uh, that uh, we, have a lot, uh, we have a lot of earthquakes in the north of the Netherlands. That's, that's not due to tectonic movement of plates, but it's due to uh, the, uh, the extraction of natural gas from the, uh, uh, from the earth. Uh, so there are cavities and the cavities collapse. So we have to get rid of that uh, and get rid of the net, uh, net, uh, use of natural gas. Um, and the municipality um, has to direct that, but um, uh, it's a complex process. Um, municipalities are understaffed, uh, they lack the knowledge, and most of all, they, um, uh, they know they have to do this transition together with uh, the residents because it impacts everybody's house. Everybody has to change something in their house. Um, but they they uh, they they uh, uh, have difficulties reaching out to uh, to residents and uh, engaging them them in the process because they are used to thinking and deciding for people instead of together with people, and um, that's that's just something that has developed over over the years. It's a kind of a paternalistic way of doing uh, doing things. Uh, usually, uh, from the, the the best of the of the the, the uh, uh, I didn't already say that uh, the best of their, their hearts. Uh, it, 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 it's not not a, a negative thing, uh, but that's just how what they're used to. So what we do is um, we um, uh, uh, the municipality hires us to find strong shoulders in the in the neighborhoods, people who want to. Um, uh, organize things uh, just like Sam does in uh, Uganda. Uh, people who want to be um, a block leader or an ambassador uh, in their community uh, to organize uh, collective buying actions or to draw plans uh, to get rid of the rid of natural uh, gas together with uh, the municipality. Because on the other side, we see a lot of people who uh, have a drive to change something, uh, to become active. But they also face difficulties becoming active because they do not know, uh, know how to start. They lack uh, technical uh, knowledge about energy, energy systems, and they often have uh, difficulties reaching out to the rest of their uh, community. And how do I uh, get into contact with the rest of my, my neighbors, uh, uh, communication wise, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where we, uh, we step in. We, uh, we, we bring them uh, together. Uh, we, we find those uh, strong shoulders uh, by the use of data, but also by the use of, uh, of networking. And our, um, my, my colleagues, uh, most of my colleagues are neighborhood coaches or community builders, community managers. And they, uh, they find those active people, uh, uh, build a strong team with them and uh, support them with uh, tools and all kinds of communication materials. Uh, a platform to uh, uh, to really build a bottom up initiative in their uh, in their neighborhood. Uh, so we're yeah we're we're uh, usually busy uh, planting the first seeds to become an energy uh, community. Thank you, uh, Jura. So you are this is uh, very much concretizing on the uh, work you are doing as a mediator actor. You already mentioned uh, that uh, the top-down approach is this uh, so-called paternalistic approach is very deeply rooted in the way uh, that the uh, the municipalities are working. Are there any other type of challenges you are facing or you want to open that a little bit, um, like how, how you're addressing that and yeah, what kind of uh, other challenges you are facing in collaborating with municipalities, but also with residents, like uh, they might have a drive, but are there any other challenges you are facing and maybe a little bit how you are overcoming them then? Yes. Um, I think the, the, the challenge on the, on the side of, of dealing with the municipalities is, is, is twofold. There's a, there's a challenge in um, um, 
uh, trying to let them uh, let them go, let, uh, let them uh, uh, let go of the control and uh, uh, sharing the control and decision power uh, with uh, with citizens. Uh, they find that that difficult to, to uh, uh, because they they feel responsible. That's, that's, uh, they feel responsible, but they um, uh, when they're when, when they're uh, handing over the the, the power that that, that that feels uncomfortable for them. But that's that's what we really need. We need uh, some some um, guts and courage at the side of the uh, municipality to uh, to, uh, to to really change things. Uh, and I think there's a, com a commercial by one of by the Snickers bar, and it it says uh, no no nuts no glory. And this is no guts no glory. If you don't don't have the guts to to do this, then you will ne never reach uh, a, a just energy transition in in time. So that's that's the um, letting go part is is a challenge. The other challenge is um, the structural uh, structural relationship, building a structural relationship with. Uh, neighborhood uh, initiatives, uh, because the energy transition is not something you can do in uh, a few weeks time. This is uh, something that, that, that takes 10, 15, maybe 20 years. So you have to be uh, uh, be in it uh, together for the long run. And that means that the municipality um, uh, has a role in um, helping uh, uh, community initiatives uh, become mature and helping them to build their own uh, business model uh, to uh, be become a strong and, and, and mature uh, uh, initiative that, that, that's in it or for the long run. You cannot uh, rely on a voluntary power uh, uh, for 10, 15, 20, uh, 20 years. Um, uh, and and that that part, uh, uh, getting a structural, um, building a structural relationship and getting structural financing uh, out of the municipality, that, that's a that's a challenge uh, as well. On the side of the uh, the residents, the challenge is always to find those strong shoulders and building a, a strong team, and uh, especially um, uh, in, in in the beginning, uh, 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 that that means uh, there's a challenge to uh, get them uh, keep them on board because the, in, especially in the beginning, it's all voluntary uh, work. And uh, that takes out a lot of uh, people. Uh, uh, people. People who are in in, in initiative have a strong drive uh, uh, and a lot of energy, uh, but it uh, it usually means uh, they do it uh, next to their daytime job or next to their family life and all those other things that take up uh, take up time. So um, um, we we. Um, uh, counter that by supporting them with all kinds of tools and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, and building a big and strong team uh, and building an extra uh, uh, circle around uh, the, the, the core team with, with supporters, uh, the minions, so to speak. Um, uh, but that's, that's a challenge as well to, to, uh, to, to keep them, to, to, to find them and to keep them, uh, keep them coming. Thank you. Um, yeah, we actually have both type of uh, participants. We have, for example, then Sam later uh, talking from uh, an driven, uh, motivated citizen perspective who, who does this also uh, besides his uh, full-time job. So we will hear more about that. We, we also have uh, these actors uh, present in the audience and uh, municipalities as well. So it will be nice to see uh, whether you uh, relate to uh, these uh, experiences. Uh, Netherlands is a unique context in a sense uh, of the geography and so on, but I'm sure that this is something that is uh, also applicable for a broader context. Uh, Philip Donner is saying in this chat that paternalistic approach is a very polite expression. In Finland, <laughs> we have an electricity distribution monopoly situation that is a strongly decisive factor in articulating energy citizenship. So this depends on the context as well, like how strong is the centralization of um, uh, energy uh, systems. Uh, thank you. I'll uh, next move to Lucilla uh, before uh, coming back later. So Lucilla, um, let me pin you first so people can see you. Um, uh, you represent an eco-village with its own energy uh, cooperative, and you're also part of Gen Europe, which is a European network uh, or global network of eco-villages. Um, for those who don't know, uh, what is an eco-village 
and how do eco villages and their communities contribute or can contribute to a broader energy transition uh, beyond its residents? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Yu Yi, for inviting me as to be a panel uh, speaker in this um, daily presentation. I'm very honored and pleased to be here with you. I'm one of the founders of Eco Village Story Superiore that is located in Western Italy, almost on the French border. We're a few kilometers away from Menton. We belong to the city of Ventimiglia. Um, what is an eco village? An eco village is a small scale village where people are fully empowered to make their decisions. So it's a community based initiative, meaning that the power stays within the hands of the residents and we are empowered to decide about our future and about our land and about our buildings. And eco villages and intentional communities are everywhere on the planet on all the continents. You can find different examples of how people have developed their own uh, living uh, lifestyle in, in different cultural contexts. And in Europe, it's under the wings of Gen Europe, the Global Eco-Village Network of Europe, that you find Gen regions all over the planet. You find Genoa for Oceania and Asia, you find the CASA in Latin America and in North America and so on and so forth. And I invite everyone to check the GEN website. Uh, specifically, in my case, I live in a, in a formerly abandoned Bindiva village that was, that is located, as I said, um, almost on the coast, on the Mediterranean coast of Italy, uh, near, near Ventimiglia. And our approach has been, um, since the very beginning, has been to save the existing um, ruin at the time, because the village had been abandoned for more than 50 years. And I believe that this choice in itself is an energy choice, because we really are, we're really conscious that everything around us is energy. Buildings contain a lot of energy. Uh, every object contains a lot of energy. So retrofitting rather than building new is an energy action. And in Italy and everywhere in Europe, you find a lot of abandoned villages that are falling to ruin. And we strongly push in the direction of uh, go back and use them rather than tear them down and build new. So we also use a, um, in the, in the eco village and international community world, we, we hold in high esteem permaculture. And permaculture is an, a, an organized discipline, a system that trains you to understand how the energy flows. So eco villages and communities are very aware and conscious of keeping their footprint very low. So how, what does it mean? The ecological foot, footprint takes into account all sorts of factors, including transport, including food, including water, including electricity. So my invitation is to broaden our concept of energy. It's not only about producing electricity with uh, photovoltaic panels. It's much more than that is about our approach to everything we do, the food we eat, the water we use, the, the objects we buy. So by producing more local food, we lower our footprint greatly because food is produced in one country and then shipped to another country and then packaged and stored and uh, refrigerated. And this has a huge, huge uh, ecological footprint on the planet. So. Um, eco villages are actively working on farming the land sustainably, organically as much as possible, permaculturally as much as possible. We are um, very um, concerned about the use of water, um, how to keep the water on the land, how to recycle the water as much as possible, how to uh, store it, how to um, filter it, how to reuse it for farming, for whatever uh, scopes, <laughs> and to, re to cut down on local transport. So to create, for instance, we have created in our case, 
local employment in the eco village we have created an eco guest house where we are self-employed and we attract people to visit us and to do training from different parts of the world and so that's also a a, a very important value for us and i want to uh, really reiterate that community and energy are a wonderful um a wonderful match because communities can change uh the situation can change uh the land can change their territory because uh, working together we multiply our strength uh, enormously we have a synergetic effect and for us in our case we have been able to retro retrofit and refurbish an abandoned village that no one can do on their own not even a millionaire would be able to do it it took us a long time I and mean, i've been here for 30 years so you have to be patient and believe in what you're doing but it can be done and we have we have been successful to some extent Thank you, Lucilla. So, uh, yeah, I'm very inspired by the eco village approach, uh, the, your values, and then the, um, how it can be applied to other, com uh, energy, uh, other communities, also energy communities. It's a very holistic approach. Uh, the awareness of energy flows. It's all, uh, it's also part of energy citizenship. So we are not only looking at the production and consumption in, uh, like, um, in heating, for example, but also beyond that in food systems, in buildings and so on. But you, you are uh, last sentences led me to uh, wonder that what kind of challenges did your community then face when you were setting up your own energy, uh, com own community energy production? If you can give a short, short um, uh, reflection on that. Well, first of all, we were challenged by the financial resources because we had to set priorities, and uh, saving the buildings for us was, of course, an urgency, and we first invested in that. And then we um, set the funds aside to create our own, um, for instance, heating systems. We went with the heating first. And to do that, we had some technical barriers, meaning people who were informed enough and trained enough to help us to put up the solar heating um, heating solar panels and then the local regulations were very contradictory we would find one at one level we were allowed to do things and on the other level we were denied the permission so we spent a lot of time working our ways through the italian regulations that are um very um uh, very rich we have too many laws and all these laws very often contradict each other so we were stopped several times on our way. And sometimes after we've already made the investment, which was a, a, a great problem for us. And, um, and another um, challenge was to, in our specific case, was how to um, insert the um, new technologies into an old building without creating a, uh, a visual effect that would be um, detrimental for the for the building that is historical is 700 years old so we had to be very very careful with the design and in the end we placed them uh, we placed the photovoltaic panels flat on the terraces because they're invisible from outside so we had to decide to cut down on the uh, efficiency to save the visual impact. And but this is very specific for us, but you can find issues like that every time you work on historical buildings. You have to take into account the, um, um, the architectural factors as well. But I would say that the, the main difficulties for us has been the contradiction of, of the norms, because sometimes it's really difficult to understand what you can or cannot do and sometimes, as I said, we found out that we were uh, denied the permission after we had already made the investment, which was, of course, a huge financial problem. And also our morale was affected by, by this piece of news.
Thank you. So at the same, by contradicting laws are actually like in easy squared one of the one of the uh, crucial results we have uh, noticed or one of the crucial uh, barriers we have noticed. And at the same time, there is uh, a lot we can do to facilitate people to access this knowledge to help uh, actors like yours or community actors like yours to access this knowledge. But if they are not coherent to begin with, then uh, the uh, help doesn't help. So there is also a need to harmonize these uh, the uh, the laws and regulations. Thank you, uh, Lucilla. I'll uh, move to Sam. Introduce to, uh, Sam to the uh, discussion. Um, if I can find him from the uh, yes, here you go. I'll pin you uh, so people can see you well. Hello, Sam. Um, so you're currently training with the Include Academy, and with this training, you are become an energy citizenship leader at the moment, uh, developing your concrete idea to support energy transition in your community. And we are happy to learn more about this uh, journey and uh, your initiative. So you, could you present your idea briefly to us and what challenge does it address and what solution are you proposing? Uh uh, Kim, again, you, uh, it, um, my network is not uh, clear. Ah. Uh, rephrase the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, could you present us uh, your idea briefly uh, that you have developed in the Include Academy and what challenge does it address, address and what solution are you proposing? So just a synthesis of that. Oh, oh thank you very much, everyone. Good morning. Uh, as, as you have said, my name is Sam. I, I come from Uganda and uh, I'm currently practicing my engineering in the hydropower plant that is in line with uh, renewable energy. And uh, I would want to uh, thank the Include Academy on their behalf uh, for giving me this opportunity to represent them in this presentation. I was uh, personally uh, chosen among the many of us who are participating in the academy to represent uh, the academy and I would want to thank you for that for giving me this opportunity to network with uh, very many people and uh, <clears throat> we have been training uh, since uh, last last year September uh, with the academy and uh, <clears throat> as our uh, soon graduating to be energy leaders uh, uh, to my idea that uh, uh, I've planned to do and I've been mentored and tutored by the Academy. I'm actually designing um, uh, a mini biogas plant for household use. Uh, after all that uh, time of training, identifying bugs were all taken through that. So I was able to zero down to biogas for household use. Actually, the, uh, uh, after the, uh, the the engagement with the with the with the community, I discovered that uh, uh, there is a lot of available material in the in the community that can be easily used, and uh, the ones that are using are put into waste. Yet we can get something affordable, cheap, and can be used for a long run. And in the long run, we, they they also become indirectly climate activists that they don't know. So biogas was the best option. And uh, the type that we have adopted is uh, a fixed dome uh, pit kind of. And this is um, for like a six meter cube uh, of volume. Uh, so this will be able to accommodate and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, affordable. A anyone in the communities can afford as long as you have uh, a minimum of eight, eight to 10 cows that can produce for you cow dung. This is good enough for you to generate uh, uh, gas for cooking and lighting for the house. And in the long run, this will this is even going to help you improve the standards of living, the social economic standards of the people, because now we realize that uh, most of the time is spent for looking for firewood, which is no longer there. So these people move a long distances even for grazing animals, yet this can be solved by just having simple pit where you can dump your cow dung and use it for cooking. And this will save uh, time for other activities. So literally this, this project was, um, was mentored and uh, 
it is through the include academy that i was able to devolve this though the challenge that i i, I faced during the work um, of the project is uh, data acquisition because um, i had to go down to the to the bottom like to the villages to gather this information from the people and this is where the interesting part of the project comes in uh, you get a lot of views from people uh, with how they perceive the which knowledge they have about renewable energy actually which is not there it's lacking a lot and so people have the ideas but uh, sometimes ex executing them is is not an easy thing so i realized that <clears throat> So that was the major problem was data acquisition. And then uh, uh, also time, I had uh, my own uh, activity that gives me daily income for, for supporting my family and all that. But now we also have the Include Academy that needs its results. And uh, so that was that imbalance in, in between there. But uh, we, we managed because you had to be a dedicated person in order to achieve uh, what is good for becoming an energy leader. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, very exciting uh, initiative that you have. And just for uh, for the others, because I've talked bilateral with you, and uh, as far as I understood, you're working uh, mainly in the rural communities in Uganda. And um, this is uh, for people to understand the context of your solution as well. And uh, what I remember from our discussion that is was very much also uh, supporting women um, in these communities when they can uh, produce energy that can be used in uh, cooking and households, for example, in this um, type of gender task. Um, so this is a difference uh, to the uh, other technical solutions we have uh, in this F academy focused or in this uh, AC Square project focused on uh, where we have worked mostly within Europe and we rely a lot on solar and wind community energy. So it was interesting to hear about uh, this other um, other type of technical solution. Um, you already uh, tapped a little bit of um, of this um, question about uh, what kind of challenges you are facing. So, as you are a citizen actor, as after all, trying to um, try to make your idea come true uh, um, or become true, and then though you have a comprehensive design thanks to the academy, um, you still face some uh, challenges in the data acquisition in terms of time as well. So, um, are there anything else that you think um, you need? Um, uh, what it takes to make your idea come true now the next step after the academy uh probably uh the first thing should be funding that is uh, the major the major thing because uh, uh the poverty levels in the community are the ones which are causing the the uh, uh, the, uh, the poverty in energy people people down there like uh, funding and uh some of them uh, don't know even uh this new technologies that are on board, uh, yet they have vast, vast uh, uh, raw materials that can be used. So uh, the most important thing is funding. If, if I can be able to get funding, I'll be able to uh, uh, sensitize communities as well. This is what is lacking. I'll be able to teach people what to do. And then uh, maybe and uh, come up with a pilot project that you will be able to uh, that you will be able to motivate the community that uh, this is the way to go. If if they can see something working, this is the right thing to go. They will all try to come in because uh, these people believe by seeing, and uh, this is caused by the uh, literacy levels that uh, are in the community. So the major thing should be funding, and then uh, also I will I will need like a team, a collective team that because uh, energy citizenship uh, is always a, a community-based, uh, the collective, according to uh, how we have understood, it's a collective uh, participation. So I will need a community that will be able to uh, uh, transform this idea to the community. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, so mm. together with uh, all all three of you, Jura, Lucila, Sam, from very different uh, different uh, type of initiatives, we are seeing the array of challenges um, that uh, all the different type of community leads are facing. So uh, we are aiming in this academy then to provide examples of the solution approaches. So in these two hours, uh, we are not learning about all the uh, solutions you have also come up with. Uh, we know that you, you also have uh, interesting approaches. So so I do uh, recommend uh, people to uh, to get to know to you better. Um like with include, they have their final event uh, tomorrow. Uh, I know that that you are, are presenting your ideas um, there as well, Sam. So uh, in case people are interested in that, I recommend you uh, uh, joining their event. And then with Burka uh, and Torre Dirvada, you can find uh, Torre Superiore. You can find more information also online. And uh, the future academies are about uh, knowledge, funding, empowering communities. So there we will uh, delve. Uh, more into these uh, approaches that can help uh, you and also the other participants to overcome these kind of challenges. But to um, to conclude this panel, I have one question which is not too simple, but I'm going to still try to ask you um, uh, this. So what does uh, energy citizenship and energy democracy mean to you? And we can start uh, with whomever uh, uh, wants to start in our panel. Sure, <laughs> I'll, I'll say something to you. Um, uh, for, for me, um, it's about uh, uh, people having the, 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 the right to take ownership of their, uh, their, their, their energy and also their, uh, their surroundings, their neighborhood. So it's it's more for me. It's more than than uh, than uh, just energy. It's also about shaping their own uh, uh, environment and and uh, improving their, their their living conditions. Uh, 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 piggy, piggyback riding on the uh, on the energy transition, uh, so to speak. And of course, it's a, it's a, it's a just transition where everybody can be be part of, uh, no matter and not not hindered by. Um, uh, language barriers, financial barriers, uh, uh, or, or whatever. So, so, so uh, just and, and also bigger than just uh, uh, just energy. Oh. Uh, okay, uh, you, uh, I, if I may go, uh, me, mine is uh, energy citizenship is uh, literally uh, a collective uh, and or an individual. Uh, participation towards uh, a more sustainable future. So, if you're if you're a community who come together and then you want to design something for for the future that is sustainable and can last and it's good for the people, that should be the the community. And then the democracy is uh, is the freedom, the freedom that people in that community are are enjoying. The they take. That, that involved in uh, policy make, uh, policy development and all sort of the things that are that are good for 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 the, a certain community to attain a, a sustainable future. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, I subscribe to Jara's and Sam's words, and I also want to reiterate the concept that for me, energy community is about awareness becoming aware of how energy is present all around us, what is embedded energy in buildings, in objects, in food, in water, and taking responsibility for the whole ener energy circle. So let's try to move out of the linear, linear thinking that moves from resources to waste and go back to a more natural circular thinking where nothing is wasted. Nature doesn't waste anything. And we have to go back to this and really learn that everything is a resource unless we are unable to read it and understand what it really is. I don't believe very much in recycling. I believe in not creating waste, first of all. And then everything we create, we have to create it in a way that it can be recycled. So it's about awareness, responsibility, and literacy. Thank you. 
Thank you. And um, I think summarizing this is, uh, yeah, you brought up inclusion and then the collective nature, uh, freedom uh, in the community to impact the uh, democratic processes and then awareness. And all this is basically also um, in our academy, in our AC Square projects, uh, the ambition of uh, broadening the role of energy communities and recognizing this transformative power that they have mm -hmm. by working yeah. more holistically on uh, on energy citizenship. Um, thank you for the panelists. I actually, we have been uh, talking for a bit now, so I would want to hear from our audience as well. We have rough a little bit over um, around uh, 15 minutes to, uh, to um, uh, for audience questions. And I'm actually seeing one question in the uh, in the chat that I'm not sure will I be able to respond to but let's try uh, together with the panelists as well it's quite challenges um, by Yulia uh, good day I have a question to the presenters in Ukraine my home country the energy situation is critical right now with 50 percent destroyed energy infrastructure by Russian shelling the energy security has been severely threatened since autumn last year a similar situation situation we can imagine for the coming winter. I'm I am presenting the project Civil Society Energy for Resilient Ukraine, and together with our colleagues, we envisage uh, to support the creation of energy communities in Ukraine. The burdens we face is not uh, only a non-favorable legislation and strongly subsidized electricity prices. Rather, we experience the increased poverty among citizens and impossibility to invest high upfront resources. What would you advise how to pull resources for an energy cooperative if the economic power of individual potential member members is uh, limited. I'm not targeting this to any of the panelists. Uh, <laughs> Jura. I thought you were going to answer it yourself, Yu Yi. <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, it's, it, that's a pickle. Um, uh, the, the first thing that comes to mind is um, um, when I think about uh, um, my country, the Netherlands, uh, after World War, uh, World War II, there was a lot of uh, financial aid coming in uh, from, the, from the U.S., uh, Marshall Hull help uh, to, uh, to rebuild the country. Um, I think it may, a solution to, to out of this could be a combination of um, uh, citizens' power, maybe, maybe not financial uh, power, but... Um, also, just uh, uh, bare hands and uh, 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 providing labor uh, to 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 rebuild and uh, uh, rebuild uh, and, and probably also uh, um, uh, sustain uh, make make it make the energy system more sustainable uh, in combination with uh, funds to 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 rebuild the total uh, energy infrastructure. So uh, a, a combination of investments uh, uh, to 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 make this possible. That's the first thing that comes to mind uh, when I think about it. Uh, can I? Yeah. I think the question, the key question is how to pull resources for an energy cooperative. And of course, we're dealing with an emergency war situation that is extremely critical and painful. So it's not an easy question to anyone. And I think many people in Europe are scratching their head, thinking of this huge challenge. But what comes to my mind is to, first of all, map the local resources. What is available locally, as Jura was saying? What has survived, not only in terms of buildings, but in terms of knowledge, in terms of land available, in terms of water available, what is still there? And then after we have mapped what is still there, we try to create a system that is sustainability based rather than ener energy consumption based. So Ukraine is facing a terrible catastrophe and hopefully in the future, we have a lot of opportunities to evolve in a more sustainable and more ecological way. If the challenge is faced with an energy saving approach. So let's see if um, we will be together as a European 
continent, we will be able to give positive answers to this huge challenge, to this huge challenge, and to um, really activate the local resources and make the local communities more resilient and less dependent on fossil fuels.